what I've got here is a pretty old, to me at least. Uh, actually, I thought it was tube type, but looking at it, it's not. It's a hybrid. It's a uh, Tektronix uh, 191 constant amplitude signal generator. Range is 350 kilohertz to 100 megahertz right here with a special selection going down here of 50 kilohertz only so I think when the knob selects this frequency it no longer uh, is variable but uh, 350 kilohertz, 0.35 megahertz, up to 100. Um, has uh, three ranges of output amplitudes from 5 millivolts to 5 volts. Now that's when it's terminated in 50 ohms and has a voltage output selector. from 5 to 50. And it has something you don't see very often, even I didn't see in the 60s very often, it has a general radio connector. I'll explain about these in a minute. Somebody thought this was a stock number 10531, 10531. And here on top it says 10531. It's, it was calibrated apparently in 91 using this procedure by good old G. Murray. But it, on this label it's identified as 2235 as an identification number as opposed to 10531. Uh, the back of it, it's uh, upside down right now. We have a selection of uh, power voltages at 115 or 230. A fuse selection for each one of those voltage selections. And then we have a three prong standard NEMA plug, 15 amp. It's not a uh, IEC, nor is it a permanently attached cord. Looking at the front we see this one single screw. I'll loosen that up. And I'll put my fingers on the back of the unit and press forward. And the whole unit now slides forward. Pretty dirty up here, but it's perfectly clean inside. And so here it is. Very clean construction. Two vacuum tubes. And these, these vacuum tubes are 7119s. And that's the only vacuum tubes inside this. We have a big... Uh, ball reduction on the front driving this four stage uh, variable capacitor. We have some nice wand coils here, probably one for each frequency range. Power transformer, RF choke, better view of the top. We have an electrolytic whose case is ground, an electrolytic inside of a plastic insulator mounted on a Bakelite base. So that is a capacitor who is not grounded. Some more tuning slugs for the coils. Here are 
some transistors in sockets, another filter capacitor, more coil, the other half of the coil uh, layout. The range selector switch is down here. And what we're selecting is mostly coils and some capacitors here. This heavy wire going back from the switch selects the coil. We have some point to point wiring here on the uh, tube bases. Get a look at that. Most of the components on this tube are either to ground or away to the switch. And most of the components on this tube are around the tube or to these little them, ceramic pieces of material with cuts in them. And the wires just lay in there. You can see they make good use of that type of construction over here. The ceramic. This was very popular with Tektronics. One of the things we can do is try to remove a tube. Now these are IERC heat dissipating tube shields. them off. So they're black anodized aluminum. They have spring fingers in here. Uh, we can see them from this side. They conduct heat from the glass envelope out to the aluminum shield. Let's see if we can get a picture of those fingers. They're actually sort of springy and they push against the vacuum, sides of the vacuum tube. So these are Amperex. Made in Holland. It looks like 6815. I don't believe that's a 63. And these are just simple dual triodes, two triodes, in independent cathodes, with control grids and, and plates. There's a little bump on this tube socket that indicates the location of the missing pin. Take the tube out. See how the tube's gripped. And that's a very clear sixty eight thirteen. The 
13th week, week of 68. Now I would have been in Vietnam. So this was a, about the time I arrived in Vietnam. I don't believe I've ever turned this on. But somebody ran it back in 91. So it looks like we have two vacuum tubes and six transistors. Are the only active components I can see. There's an interesting note on this transistor right here. I'll, I'll zoom in on it. Now it's referring to this metal uh, Q94 metal cased. It says transistor case elevated and the schematic says it's elevated 5 to 500 volts DC above ground. Uh, there's a capacitor here. And this capacitor has a date code of 6726. Sixty seven twenty six. Looking at the bottom of that capacitor, you can see it has three twist tabs that are intimate with ground, and it has one section here, only one that is. Uh, a capacitor. And if we look at it, we can see I think it's a 550 microfarad at 50 volts DC. Let's take a look at the other electrolytic. Here we have one that's got four tabs connected to ground. They just push in and twist a little bit that locks it in place and two uh, capacitor t connections we'll look at the capacity a bit it's a 40 and 40 microfarad at 500 volts DC I'll find an extension cord and we'll power this up I was going to say something about these general radio RF connectors. So there it is. Four external metal panels. Two of them are straight and two of them have lips on the sides. See that? Hold it up here. See there's a lip over here. A lip opposite these two panels are straight and although these panels on the outside form a circle so do these little panels inner panels form a circle but it, it, it's smaller than this OCD take a look at them here and the inside connector is made the same way four panels too big too small And these are genderless. Uh, anytime you have one of these connectors, it mates with any other one. They push together. This is a 50 ohm 1 watt attenuator made by rubbed off but you can see it's marked on the uh, connectors general radio these connectors are almost always found on high quality laboratory equipment 
I didn't use anything with these connectors except for a General Radio 916 impedance bridge, which is actually a piece of laboratory equipment that I used in the 60s and 70s to do proof of performance testing on AM radio stations. If you used the General Radio 1916 bridge, you needed to drive it with about one watt of uh, RF unmodulated at the transmitter frequency. So if you had the money to buy a general radio oscillator it would have connectors like this. But most people just had enough money to buy the impedance bridge and you'd use some sort of a maybe even a Heath kit RF oscillator. So these connectors were not common in my world but they were very common in laboratory cases. A banana by a banana general radio and here's a general radio by B and C. And so there's no such thing as a male or a female Let's pull this apart general radio connector. Don't see them much anymore. I found a, a data sheet, on, a summary sheet on the web of this device. Two tubes, six transistors, a constant amplitude signal generator, blah, blah, blah. A range of 350 kilohertz to 100 megahertz. It was first produced in 1966, and in 1966 it cost $700. I have this summary sheet, uh, the entire, well, a summary sheet uh, of the electronic devices, the vacuum tube. And I have the full uh, operating manual, which is worth taking a look at, even if you don't own one of these. Every single screw, nut, bolt, everything. This, this, here's, a, here's a toroid wrapped around a loop in the coax. There's a toroid holder here. You don't see one of them very often. That's in the part book. Everything. Theory of operation, calibration. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, 80s, the manuals were truly a manual. All right, this thing was last. We know it was powered in 1991. That's when the uh, Army Material Command uh, did the calibration. It probably left Army service, at least the Army Material Command, somewhere between 91 and 92. Otherwise, it would have been recalibrated. The Army's pretty good at that. I think I've owned this for 20 years and never powered it up. I've got a 50 ohm termination on here, and it's a hook to an oscilloscope. I'm going to power it on right now. See if I can find a front switch. It should produce 5 volts peak to peak at 22.5 megahertz. That's the setting on front dial. 5 volts, 22.5 megahertz. We'll see if any smoke appears. I'm going to lean back. Doesn't appear to be smoking. No output. Vacuum tubes, of course. And we have an output. A 
OK. The frequency counter in the scope says 22.511 megahertz. That's not bad for a dial setting. And uh, unless my hookup is incorrect, the peak to peak output voltage is one volt. That's a fifth of what it should be. So the thing came alive. It's oscillating, at least at that frequency. Uh, the output appears to be low. I'll have to check my hookup. I'll turn the band switch. I think this is up. Okay, so there we're at 53 megahertz. I don't know what the dial says. And you'll notice the output fell a little tiny bit. It's at 100 on the uh, 100 megahertz band switch setting. I'm not sure what the range is. I mean, I'm practically in the middle of the range of each band switch. We'll go back to uh, 22.5 megahertz. It now reads 22.48. Remember, this thing's warming up for the first time in at least 20 years. And you'll see as I go down in frequency, very little amplitude change. I'm still about uh, 1 volt peak to peak. Going down. I'm at... Uh, 924 kilohertz right now, still uh, 1 volt peak to peak. Okay, this is the next variable frequency step, and it's uh, 437 kilohertz, of course the range, it's the middle of the range. And this should produce 50 kilohertz. It's not variable. And right now, according to the immediate, according to the counter in the scope, it's 49.4 kilohertz, and uh, one volt peak to peak, a little tiny bit more, 1.05. So. This thing is oscillating. Let's go to 100 megahertz. Okay, this is full scale. See, it drops off a little bit, but that could be that I'm using very thin coax. The instruction manual would like me to use RG8 with these increase in order to maintain a constant output. Okay, the dial is in excess of 100 megahertz. I can't stick my head over and read it. And the output is 101.4 megahertz. So it appears that the range of this thing is just fine. And it is maintaining a constant output. So I'll probably put the case, well, maybe not. I'll make some arrangements for part two of this video where I try to find out why it's to find out why it's not outputting its rated 5 volts. So for part 2, I'll rearrange this electronically. I'll see that I can put my eyes on the front scale so I can read the dials and knobs. This information is all available in the uh, subdirectory below. You know how that works. So if you've enjoyed this bringing a tube device back to life, or at least seeing that it still lives, haven't brought it back to life yet, um, give me a thumbs up and come back for part two. Thank you.